Okay, and the next strategy is something called customer lock-in. And uh, this strategy and the next one, these are at the bottom of the ranking. These are probably strategies that uh, are a last resort. They're certainly not something that you want to incorporate. There's a lot of issues with them. But, but customer lock-in essentially means that you make the uh, cost of switching to a different product more expensive. And if you make it expensive enough, your consumers won't switch. And because they're now locked into your product, you'll be able to charge them more. And you can charge them more up to the limit where they no longer find it too costly to switch. And this is, despite my, in my opinion, not being a great strategy, something that has been relatively effectively implemented in a lot of different cases. Uh, probably the most famous cases uh, the one of, uh, or, or the case of uh, printers, right? So printers are almost always sold at a loss. Uh, so printers are really cheap, like the machine is cheap. But where they make their money is in the ink, and they sell it in proprietary cartridges that are really hard to uh, refill on your own. So you have to keep going back and buy the same proprietary cartridge, uh, even though the ink is the same in every printer. But the specific method of putting the ink in the printer is different. So they sell you a printer for nothing, and then they sell you the ink for $100 a, a cartridge, right? It makes printer ink like one of the most expensive liquids in the, on the planet. This is customer locking. If I've already bought the dang printer, I'm just going to keep buying the ink, right? And now that I know there are ways to uh, get around it and to do all that, but it's messy and it's hard, and you need hypodermic needles and all kinds of things that are just make it more difficult than most people are willing to change. And because it's more costly to have to buy a new printer and then just get locked into that ink. Lots of people don't switch. They just keep buying the same old ink from the same old company and they don't have a lot of other options, right? So that's customer lock-in. It, it gives them ability to charge a huge price premium because the consumers don't have another choice. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, is this really a very good strategy in terms of keeping your customers happy, right? If the only reason I'm here is because I can't go somewhere else, and because of that, you're gouging me, if another opportunity opens up, I am gonna jump ship as quick as possible, right? So there are lots of other examples here. Another big famous one uh, is taxis. Taxis were, I mean, maybe lots of you guys have never actually taken a legit taxi because Uber's been around for a long time now, but taxis back in the day, they were just like awful. Awful. I mean, the reason Uber got so big so fast is because taxis were terrible. You would fly, you would go to somewhere you'd never been, you'd get in a car, they would just start driving, they would put the meter on, you have you you wouldn't you it was before like cell phones, so you couldn't like see the map, you didn't know where they were going. They were famous for you know driving around in circles, uh, because of course you didn't know where you were, overcharging you, you didn't have another option. I uh, I once went to Barcelona on a trip and the guy drove me around in a circle twice before I saw the same building and realized what he was doing and started yelling at him. And he dropped me off and I know we're charging like 50 bucks, right? So taxis were a terrible service, but you were locked in. If you were somewhere where you didn't have a car or where you didn't know you were going, you had to take a taxi. And then boom, Uber. As soon as Uber came out and you could call it with your, you, you could call it with your phone, you could see the map where you were going, you could agree on the price in advance and pay it in advance without having any cash changing hands. All of a sudden, Every single person that used to take a taxi was like, hell no, never again. I'm getting in a, uh, I'm, I'm getting in an Uber, right? Or a Lyft or whatever. So customer lock-in worked great for taxis for years till, until something new came up and everybody jumped ship as fast as they could, right? So uh, customer lock-in is a strategy that is sustainable, right? And uh, it, it's not, I'm not necessarily selling it as it's always a bad thing. Right? Sometimes customer lock-in just happens organically. So like this example, doctors train on sort of specific medical equipment. And there may be, say, a new, uh, a new stint or, or a new sort of operating procedure or, uh, you know, a new, uh, you know, and maybe a new, or some new equipment in the operating room that they might be able to use or new, uh, you know, imaging equipment or something. But because of what they've trained on, it becomes very costly for them to retrain on a new thing, even if there's a slight improvement. So you find that this lock-in happens and allows these companies to charge a price premium simply because the improvements in newer products are not great enough yet to, to get most of, to get doctors to switch, right? Once the improvements become so good 
that it's worth the cost of the doctor to, to go into all the training, then they switch and the price premium disappears, right? So this isn't maybe, this is not necessarily like an evil thing. Uh, it's just something that sometimes happens organically. It happens to professors too, right? We pick a book, we, uh, you know, I sign a book, I don't assign books anymore because I don't like them, but you pick a book, you read through the book, you look at the example problems, you look at the homework problems, you, you think about how you're gonna teach it, you start to make slides. Once you have all that made, you have put in an enormous amount of effort into uh, using this book, using this product, right? Your slides are tied to the book, your example problems are similar to the ones in the book. Maybe you've even used like the test bank from the book and things like that. And all of a sudden, now you, it's way too costly to switch to a new book, even if it's way better, right? Lots of professors just aren't even gonna look because it's just not worth the effort. So that's customer lock-in and it means that, uh, you know, a book company can charge more because a professor's not gonna switch, right? Now, but again, that has a limit and some people reach that limit sooner than others. For me, I reached that limit like right away when books were, you know, books are charging $300 for a new book. I just am saying, I'm not going to use a book anymore. I'm going to make my own slides and my own problems and my own exams and screw all that. Right. So uh, customer lock-in is a dangerous strategy. It's not always evil. Sometimes it's just natural. But it is still dangerous because as soon as if all you're relying on to charge your generate value and charge your price premium is customer lock in, as soon as a better option is available, uh, you're going to get people to switch and leave you behind. Now, the last one. The last one is something called price discipline. And this one is more or less illegal, right? Uh, or, or at least it's borderline in, in any way, right? So to, to charge a price premium, one of the ways that you can do it is you can collaborate with all of your uh, all of your peers, all of your competitors, and just charge higher prices. Right? Economics would say if I charge ten dollars and my competitor charges five, and we sell the same product, everybody's going to buy from my competitor because nobody in their right mind is going to want to pay ten for something that they can pay five for. Right? But a better strategy for both of us would be for us just to shake hands and say, Hey, listen, what if we both charge ten? Right. Now we are forming what's called a cartel, right? or at least we're uh, implicitly colluding with each other. This is called price collusion. And the collusion is that we're both going to charge a higher price than what it's worth. We're going to charge a price premium uh, and we're going to agree not to undercut the other person because if we can sustain this agreement, then we can both make more money in the long run. Now, of course, this is illegal because this is incredibly harmful for consumers. Uh, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. In fact, it happens a lot. Uh, and uh, it happens in some big ways. One of the biggest ways, the biggest cartel and the oldest cartel is called OPEC. It's the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries. And these are the world's biggest oil producing countries. And they have formed a international cartel whereby they agree to set the price of oil regardless of the cost of oil. Right? So they set the price of oil and they charge whatever they want. They try to charge as big a premium as they want. Uh, there is, uh, they have been really successful um, and uh, they sort of dominate the oil market. Uh, it's been a little less successful over the last 10 years as the United States have found, uh, which is one of the biggest countries, oil producing countries that's not a part of OPEC. But the US has found alternate uh, methods to drill and produce oil that has weakened considerably the power of OPEC but not to the point where OPEC is still not a, a major player, right? So uh, if you form a cartel, you are able to illegally raise prices uh, and, and, and hurt consumers. Now, in the U.S. It's, and, and, and most of you know, Western Europe and, and, and most countries, it's illegal uh, for companies to do this, even though even in some of those countries, it might be illegal for a company to do it, but the country itself is also is participating in a cartel. So there's a lot of hypocrisy there. Uh, but still, most com companies are, it's illegal, but it still happens a lot. Uh, there, and there was a big scandal in the 80s in the U.S. There was a milk cartel. Uh, so the north, on, the, on the East Coast here and Northeast, all, a bunch of the big dairy farms had colluded to raise the price of milk. And they were one of the main suppliers of milk in the country. And they were charging significantly higher prices. And they finally, the FBI finally busted them and stuff like that. Um, so there is still cartels going. Uh, of course, it's a lot harder to do it, uh, especially when it's illegal. Uh, again, this is not something McKinsey is going to be recommending to some company that's trying to increase value. No McKinsey consultant is going to come in and say, hey, listen, you guys want to make more money? You should form a cartel. Uh, just don't tell the FBI I said that. Right? 
Uh, but it is, it is something that you can do, right? Uh, Christ discipline, right? There are other stories of less explicit collusion where, you know, maybe the five CEOs of the milk companies all sit down at a table and they all sort of look at each other and go, listen, we're not going to sign any papers or shake any hands, but you know what would be really good? If we all charged more money, right? And so there are some cases where there's this legal gray area where they didn't make any official agreements and they didn't do anything official, but they still managed to form a sort of unofficial agreement that's benefiting everybody in the long run. There's also just some cases of price discipline where we know that, that neither of those things can be the case. And one of the most unique and interesting ones to me is the case of real estate agents. Now, for decades, real estate agents across the country have all charged the same rate, 6%, right? Now there's millions of real estate agents, so there's no way that they are colluding it. You know, they're not having some giant meeting where they're all shaking hands together. There's just no way that's happening, but they're all charging 6%. There's no enterprising young uh, real estate agent trying to steal the market willing to charge 3% for their service, which to me is one of the most unique things in finance, that there is this price discipline that's arisen within the real estate market, and it's lasted and sustained for dozens and dozens of years, uh, and, uh, and it still hasn't changed, right? There still hasn't been someone who said, basic economics says I should charge 5% and get all the market and screw everybody else. And then we see a race to the bottom and we see real estate agents not really making any money anymore, which to me is surprising, but it is a, a, a non-illegal form of price discipline that has turned out to be very sustainable. So. Price discipline, illegal, probably sustainable, but of course that's only until you get busted.